Hi, my name is Daphne Agosin and I collaborated with the director and costume designer to create uh, an imagined set and lighting ideas for this play, for this festival. My goal with this short video is to introduce the story of the setting by piecing elements of space and time of Wine in the Wilderness. Hopefully, looking at this imagined set before watching the reading will help create mental images to accompany this experience. The play begins on a night of the riots of 1964. The Harlem Uprising began mid-July when 15-year-old James Powell was shot and killed by white off-duty police, Lieutenant Thomas Gilligan. The riot lasted six days after the initial confrontation and was very violent. With extreme poverty and discrimination fueling anger, the 1964 race riot was just one among many that would take place in the coming decades in American cities. As we look at photographs of Harlem of the time, we can imagine Bill in an inalterable state. He is an artist on a mission and not even the political unrest can distract him from it. He is certainly not apathetic, as we soon, soon will learn, but he believes his mission transcends even the riest of circumstance. Who is Bill Jameson? Bill Jameson is loosely based on BAM writer, poet, activist Amri Baraka Leroy James, born in 1934 and died in 2014. Like Baraka, Bill was born in the early 30s. Like Baraka, he was the son of postal mail workers. However, that is only children's starting point and only part of Bill, the painter and the studio's reader. So what does his face look like? What is his painting style like? Maybe, like Childress as a writer, Bill as a painter is most concerned with portraying a truth. That is where his creative energy comes from, and as the play progresses, his truth and style is modified. It's possible to connect Bill to a constellation of artists, those associated with Harlem or with the Black Arts Movement, or portrayers of classic Black beauty. Maybe someone who has the force of Sam Gillian's abstraction, or that can integrate Benny Andrews' naive expressions of culture without losing Bill's intellectual inclinations. A style may be informed and inspired by Lou May Lou Jones, like in this realistic impression of a girl superimposed in a geometric flatter background, or a realistic painter, but not as cool as Bartley Hendrix. I personally see Bill the painter as the historically accurate invention of an artist between the two elegant representational painters Elzir Kortor and contemporary painter Titus Kafar. Both of them seem to me to share the play's theme of heritage and timelessness. His face fulfills many functions. It is messy and a source of inspiration and expression. It holds an impressive library with objects that denote how knowledgeable he is. It is a social space and a place where he showcases all of what he has built. The ground plan integrates elements you may have already seen in research images, centering the space and the function of the art studio, but also incorporating a social space, his living area, and even the kitchen all under one space with no walls. In the beginning of the play, we find Bill by himself in the studio. In order not to give away any moments of the play, the rest of the images have no characters in them. However, we can recognize different light moments as we go from night to day, creating more intimate and social spaces.
I lost myself on a cool, damp night Gave myself in that misty light Was hypnotized by strange delight Under a lilac tree My name is David Arevalo and I'm a third year MFA costume designer at Northwestern University. And I did the costume design for Alice Childress's Wine in the Wilderness. So I like to think of costume design, especially maybe with Wine in the Wilderness, as less designing clothes um, and more specifically about designing characters really thinking about who these people are um, and how we can use the clothes that they're wearing to explain uh, who they are as people. Why did they choose what they are wearing today when they woke up, if that makes sense. So um, my process begins with a lot of research uh, and that research will take me through um, historical content and context. So I'll start by researching the playwright, Alice Childress, I was really excited to learn a lot about Alice Childress. I had never read her her work. I didn't know much about her, which is really unfortunate because she's an incredible playwright uh, and she's really missing from the American realism theater canon, if you ask me. Um, and then learning about the time period in which this play was written, so the mid to late 60s and what are the things that Alice Childress was responding to. So learning about the black arts movement, reading about the Black Arts Movement, um, the Moynihan Report, reading about kind of the American attack on Black matriarchy. Um, a lot of the conversations at the time were really pitting a large collection of America against Black women. Um, so that helps to put the play in a really um, solid context for me. So I understand why Alice Childress was writing what she was writing when she was writing it. Um, but that allows me to then move into um, researching a lot of art. So I wanted to start with artists of the time period, um, but then also just, uh, it's important to find artists and contemporary art that speaks to the, the characters. And it's kind of hard to explain, but like, what is the thing that f you find inspiring about any one piece of art? Um, but you're just looking for something that sparks an interest or sparks a feeling in you. And I guess I can just say that like, I know it when I see it. Um, and in particular, myself and uh, the director, Jasmine, really responded to this contemporary artist, Robert Pruitt. Um, and his work does a really wonderful thing, which it, it puts very regular people into a context that, um, kind of like, it turns them into royalty almost. It just flips our expectations on its head. Um, and by very simple addition. So maybe he would paint someone with a throw wrapped around their shoulders, but then based on the composition, based on the angle that he's painting them from, all of a sudden this person looks like royalty. They look regal. Um, based on the light that's hitting them, uh, maybe it emulates a kind of historical painting where you would be painting a king or a queen. And, and seeing contemporary black people painted in this way is is really significant for me as a POC. I think I grew up not seeing enough people who looked like me um, revered in art. And I think there's an interesting uh, parallel in this play, which is that like to paint someone is to turn them into art. So even painting regular people is to give them reverence, is to turn them into art. So Tommy, Tomorrow Marie, uh, the main character of this play, is just such a marvelous, brilliant character that Alice Childress has written. Um, one thing that was really important to me and to Jasmine, the director, from the beginning 
was that we recognize that Tommy, um, though Bill describes this character, the third part of the triptych, as uh, the worst kind of black woman, that Tommy herself, we're seeing Tommy on the worst day of her life. This is a woman who has lived through a riot. It's easy to forget maybe that the backdrop of this play is a real event, the 1964 Harlem riots. Um, and Tommy's apartment was burned down. Who knows what she survived that day. Um, when we were digging through images, you know, there was a lot of police brutality. Um, who knows what Tommy faced to get into Bill's studio that evening. So then the idea that this man would take a look at her and decide that as she exists today is what represents her in her everyday life is so sad and so unfortunate. So it was important to us to think about Tommy's clothes as not just, um, not just dirty or gross or something like that, but like, what would this woman have picked up in a hurry? What would she have picked up? And she's literally only carrying the things on her back and what she can carry in a brown paper sack. Um, we learn so much from Tommy in this play. I think my favorite thing about her is that she teaches us and she teaches Bill, most importantly, but all of us, that we are so much more than formal education. We are so much more than um, than book smarts. You know, our lived experience is representative of sometimes generations of knowledge. And that kind of knowledge is literally irreplaceable. Tommy is, um, is so special. She's such a special character and um, such a special person. And it was just, it was a joy to render her, it was a joy to draw her, to read her, um, and to listen to Jaslyn bring her to life, to bring her strength and her power and her bravery um, to life. So Bill Jameson, um, it's difficult to describe, is he the protagonist? Is he the antagonist? Um, I don't know exactly how I would describe him, but he's the main male character in the play. Um, and Bill Jameson is a really complicated man. Um, there's a, a, a strong parallel between him and a real life person, Amiri Baraka, who's a writer and a cultural icon of the 1960s and 70s black arts movement. Um, and Alice Childress was most likely responding directly to Amiri Baraka and his influence when she was writing this play. Um, Amiri Baraka and a lot of black men in this time period were, were trying to reclaim their own identity, an identity that had been stolen from them by white supremacy and by white America. And there was a lot of misplaced anger, I think, um, from these black men onto matriarchy, black matriarchy. Because as difficult as it might seem in 2020 to wrap my brain around that idea, like to blame your mother or your sister um, or your grandmother for taking responsibility or taking leadership during times when someone needed to do that, I, I can empathize. It's important to find empathy for all of these characters. And I can empathize for Bill. Um, he is trying desperately with his work and with his art to shape his community and to redefine what it means to be a black man in America. He wants to reclaim some power, some self-respect, um, and give himself and his fellow men some purpose. Uh, and I think that that is a very important and significant goal. So he's not wrong entirely with what he's trying to do, maybe just how he's trying to do it. And I think meeting Tommy really helps him to, 
to think about a better way maybe to do the work that he's doing that doesn't alienate the women who have in fact been here, been there for him and for uh, all the men in the crew. Um, Old Timer is the first person in this play, I think, who gives us an inkling of, of um, the kind of person who Bill sees in the street constantly and doesn't really know anything about. We know Old Timer only by his name, uh, by his nickname, Old Timer. Um, Bill doesn't really know anything about him. He never bothered to know anything about him um, until Tommy shows up. Old Timer has been in this community for a very long time and um, he has a lived experience that isn't respected um, and isn't of interest to a lot of the new younger people that are moving in. Um, I think a lot of the younger people like Bill and Sunny Man and Cynthia, they see him as a neighborhood fixture for sure. Everyone recognizes him. I think we wave at him when we pass him on the street, but you never bother to think, what is that man's story? And I think um, Tommy allows us to take a pause and for the first time ask that. Um, ask, who are you? And, um, and ask ourselves, why didn't we care enough to find out who you were? Sunny Man is a really funny character to me. Um, he's about six years younger than Bill. And so I think of Sunny Man as kind of like a younger brother figure to Bill. I think he looks up to Bill a lot, um, but I think he's a different version of the, the kind of man that Bill is. He's, a, he's also an artist, but he's a writer. Um, so I think he thinks of himself as slightly more academic, slightly more civilized maybe than Bill is. And I think we see that in the type of woman that he's attracted to, um, in his wife, Cynthia. He has found himself um, a college-educated woman. I think they're very interested in um, like progress through assimilation, which was like a very particular kind of access point for marginalized communities in this period. Um, Sunny Man has a complicated relationship with women in that he expects a lot from them, right? We see him expecting his wife to not only be brilliant and bring home an income, but also at the drop of a dime, be able to make some scrambled eggs. And that's a tall order. Cynthia um, is such a marvelous character that Alice Childress wrote into this play. Um, Cynthia, I think, is very complicated in herself. She's college educated, she's a social worker, so she's able to exist in kind of both of these worlds um, that, we've, that we're discussing. I think she's representative of a type of woman in this time period who um, was willing to temporarily maybe take a back seat. I think she was willing to do that for a moment in order to allow a sense of equilibrium to return maybe. But I definitely think there's a part of Cynthia who sometimes in a moment of clarity thinks, I didn't imagine I was going to be doing this forever. My research for Cynthia was based on a few significant women in the time period, but specifically Kathleen Cleaver, who was one of the first female Black Panthers who had voting power um, in the organization. Um, and one thing that was really interesting to me about um, Kathleen Cleaver was that she was in an extremely patriarchal organization, the Black Panthers at the time. In, you, in photos of her, you see her kind of consistently keeping a very femme uh, look. And, and that, that kind of juxtaposition, right, is really fascinating to me that like, part of that is like, is this curated? Did she do this on purpose? Was it important to her that she be feminine? Cynthia talks in the play about how she's trying to explain to Tommy that we have been doing for ourselves for too long and it's made us too hard. 
our men want us to be feminine. And I see those parallels when I see these photos of Kathleen Cleaver who had so much power and so much, um, such an important part of black American history. And she's in these like gorgeous kind of chiffon gowns. And I think how much of this was done um, brilliantly for a reason, for messaging, uh, very purposeful messaging. And that's what I think of Cynthia. I think like her look is curated. I think her as a person, she's curated, she's purposeful. And I think she um, is going to succeed. <laughs> I think we see at the end of the play that uh, her and Sunny Man are probably gonna have a really long conversation.